2023 was a great year to play board games because tables and board games continue to exist. Who knows if that'll be the case for 2024. Loads of new games were released last year, but only some of them were good. In this video, I'm gonna share my top 10 board games of 2023. And if you wanna know my next 10 favorite games, I've made an exclusive video for my patrons talking about my numbers 20 to 11, which you can watch on Patreon, link below. Quick disclaimer, I received review copies of all of the games on this list, but this video is not sponsored, no money changed hands, and no one has a say in what games I pick except me. And that's been true of all of my videos since Actual LOL began, but I thought I'd start making it extra clear. And if you want to buy any of the games, you can support the channel by using the links below. Right, let's get to the list. The Last Kingdom is a great game that I probably won't keep. I can't keep keeping all the good games I find every year, and I don't think I'll be able to get this one to the table enough. It doesn't help that it's based on a TV series that none of my friends had even heard of, and it's got that photographic art which screams lazy cash grab. But if you can look past that, there's a really interesting game in the box. The game depicts a war in Britain between the Vikings and the Saxons, and you each play as characters caught up in that drama. And one of the things I love about this game is that you're a bunch of selfish individuals who will switch sides like a glory hunting football fan. You might start off supporting the Vikings, then when they're struggling, switch to Saxons, then switch back again before breakfast because pastries are on the menu. It's a zoomed out view of a war. You're not getting your hands dirty on the battlefield, but making the grand tactical decisions. As this battle stands, the Saxons would win because they outnumber the Vikings. But now comes your chance to influence the outcome, using your cards and actions to kill troops, add them, or move them in from elsewhere. You only have six cards to last five battles, and it's so tempting to use all of them in the first one, like a school kid eating their sandwiches at 10 a.m. But so often, when you put your side ahead, someone else will fight back and cancel it out. The clever play is in picking the right time to use your cards to make a lasting difference. You're not gonna get all five battles to go your way, and knowing when to cut your losses is everything. If you're allied to the winning side, you get points based on how strong your affinity is to that faction. So you could score 10 points, and Tom, who was helping you orchestrate the victory, scores 20. It's like finding out your colleague is the boss's son, and they're getting paid more than you. And that's the crux of the game. You have to put yourself first. It's not just about winning, it's about profiting the most and keeping an eye on your rivals. If you're making someone else richer every time you win, you need to switch sides and take them down. If you don't, you're just a naive kingmaker. I love that dynamic of selfish cooperation. It's great fun when someone suddenly switches sides and swings a battle in the other direction especially after everyone has used all their cards. I only wish the game wasn't so long. With four players, it took us at least four hours, and it doesn't feel grand enough to warrant that length. I rarely have time to play games that long, and if I do, I've got a lot of epic games in my collection competing for that opportunity. Triketa builds upon one of the best filler card games of all time, Coloretto, by borrowing its key mechanism. You're adding animals to rows, creating collections of tiles, enough for each of you to go home with one of them. You draw a tile and decide which row to add it to. You're trying to create a collection that you want to take, but if you make it too good, someone else will take it first, because instead of adding a tile, you can cash out and take one of the rows. It's like you're making buffet plates for the family. You can't risk putting all the sausage rolls on one plate because someone will grab it before you're finished. And if you only put celery on the other plates, you'll be gutted if you're left with them. But cashing out feels wrong. Sure, the early bird gets the worm, but it spends the rest of the day worrying that a better worm came along later. It's that lack of sleep that made them anxious. And I love the rising tension of each round. At the start, you're all in it together, buying each other drinks like the night will never end, but the later it gets, it becomes ever more tempting to go home. So you all go quiet, waiting for someone to ruin the night for everyone else. You're trying to get three of the same animal. Three bears are worth 10 points, but getting four of an animal is a nightmare. Four bears are worth minus one point, so taking one too many bears 
loses you 11 points, which is what makes the game so spicy. When an opponent already has three bears, you'll do everything you can to force them to take another one. Adding tiles is just as much about poisoning rows, adding a chili to the plate you want so you know no one else will take it, or even better, adding a chili to all three plates so no matter what plate they take, they're gonna suffer. I love how fixated everyone gets in pulling each other back in this game. And the extra touch is when you're adding tiles, you're allowed to take two face down, so no one knows what you have, which creates some fun surprises at the end. It is very similar to Coloretto. I think it's more fun, but I'm not gonna argue with anyone who thinks the opposite. I'll be keeping Coloretto as well because it's perfect to fit in my wife's handbag for when we go to a dinner party and I wanna take a game that we never end up playing. Match of the Century is a two-player game in which you're trying to win a famous chess match, but you're not playing chess. It's a chess game, not a game of chess. I don't know how to make that any clearer. It's from the same line as Watergate, an incredible two-player game that also portrays a part of history I couldn't care less about, and does such a good job of bringing it alive that it makes me want to read the historical booklet that comes with the game, at some point. To win the chess match, you need to win six games of chess, and each game is broken up into four exchanges. An exchange is where you both play a card and the highest wins, gaining you the advantage. If you have the advantage after four exchanges, you win that game. But not the game, because this time it's called a match. There's two really cool things that I want to tell you about. The first is that you only get to use the power on your card if you lose the exchange. And they're so good that sometimes you're desperate to lose because you need the power to help you long term. It means it's great to play second because you can decide whether to respond with a higher card and beat them or take the loss to use an amazing power. So much of the game is that decision. Or if you don't want them to win and you don't want them to use their power, you can force a tie so no one gets anything. The second cool thing is that your hand of cards is double sided and it changes whether you're playing as white or black. Your special power is only on one side of the card, so your hand transforms from game to game. It's agonizing having to play a card on its weaker side, like going into battle with Bruce Banner when you know what the Hulk is capable of. If you like intelligent head-to-head -head two player card games like Watergate or Air, Land and Sea, you need to check this one out. And yeah, it feels weird to play a game about chess when I don't actually play chess, but I play video games about killing people and I don't do that anymore either. The inevitable truth at the heart of Empire's End is that Empire's End. And here you are sat in the bunker at your Empire's End. Everything is going wrong all at once. You're being plagued by floods and flooded with plagues. Look, I'm not saying Empire's End is a bad game, but it's one disaster after the next with this one. No, really, that's how it plays. It throws a disaster at you and you must try to bat it away. It works like a protection racket. As long as you keep paying, the disaster won't break your legs. But if you run out of wheat or decide not to pay, then it will destroy your town. But when you take a disaster, you get all the tokens that everyone else paid to avoid it. So sometimes it's worth it to help you fend off an even worse disaster later on. But how long do you wait before you take it? The more times you send it around the table, the more tokens you'll get. But eventually it becomes too good not to take and someone else could grab it first. It's a brilliant mechanism. And that's because it's taken from No Thanks, one of the best simple card games there is. Empire's End has wrapped a bigger game around it. The other benefit to taking a disaster is the innovation that comes with it that will help you grow more wheat or bolster your army. It seems your people learn through misery which was the motto at my school. I love what these add to that core decision. They make certain disasters worth taking because it will pay itself back in the long run and make you really want to protect certain locations because you can't use an innovation if it's on fire. There's a really satisfying mix of focusing on your own empire, making the best of things despite all the pestilence, crossed with that player interaction every time you bid on the disasters. I love trying to work out what another player's price will be, and it's especially interesting late on when the same disaster would kill my three-point farm, but Ben's 32-point city. The game grinds you down. By design, you start with a pristine empire, 
and end up with half of it on fire. And some people will find that demoralizing, but I really like that fresh perspective. Every other game is about building up and up. This one is about how well you can take your punches. And it feels thematic. Like the Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius said, stay calm and serene, whatever life throws at you. Although maybe if he wasn't so busy writing books, his empire would still be around. All my favorite two-player games involve getting in each other's way. And in Orion Jewel, that's literally what you're doing on the board. You're trying to create a path from one side to the other. If you do, you win the game. So your opponent is trying to stop you while creating one of their own. Every attempt you make to push forward is met with a block, diverting you to take the long way round. Like trying to walk a straight line through Ikea. It looks remarkably like Blockbusters, the quiz show from the 80s, in which you're also trying to create paths of blue hexes from one side to the other. I'm not saying they've copied it, I just think the simulation we're all living in has run out of ideas. To make matters worse, your tiles are infected by your opponent's colour. Every time you try to make progress for yourself, you're forced to add their colour to the board as well. It's two steps forward, one step back. You want to run away, start a new thing, but they follow you wherever you go, like Bacni. You wriggle and squirm your way around the obstacles, and if you do win, it's always this last ditch stretch across the line, like scoring a try in rugby right by the corner flag as your ankle escapes their grasp. That in itself feels like a solid game, but it's the other two ways to win that take things up a notch. On the board, you have galaxies and black holes. If you can connect up four galaxies with your colour, you immediately win the game. It's the perfect distraction. You'll take the tiniest of detours from your path to get a nearby galaxy, but that's all it takes to lose control of the game. It's classic space hubris. Matthew McConaughey in Interstellar just wanted to check out a cool planet, and suddenly his daughter is Jessica Chastain, which in this case is a bad thing. With the black holes, you can win by connecting three of them to your opponent's color. So it's this bitchy sabotage, like you've given up making a path for yourself and you just start throwing trash at theirs. It adds this extra thing to think about. If the most direct route is next to a black hole, should you take the risk? I've had great moments where I'm one turn away from completing my path, but if I do, it will join up three black holes and lose me the game. It's the sort of two player game you can learn in seconds and you'll always play at least three times in a row. I love that every decision matters, but it doesn't tie my brain in knots. If you want to try it out, you can play it for free on Board Game Arena. <music> Forbidden Jungle is the fourth game in the Forbidden series of cooperative games after Forbidden Island, Forbidden Desert, and Forbidden Sky. Forbidden Desires, my fanfiction erotica, has been deemed not part of the canon by Matt Leacock and I've since been forbidden contact. I find there's something magical about these games. They immerse you in their own vibrant world, but in a simpler, punchier way than other cooperative games. And there's a familiarity that runs through them. It's like doing an escape room for the fourth time. You're excited to see what new twists they've added to what you know and love. This time you're trying to escape an alien planet and your enemies are these giant spiders, which is great. No, I like spiders. Whenever they come into my flat, I offer them my cookbooks and complete works of Shakespeare. You're exploring the jungle by revealing face down tiles, which I always love in games. It makes it feel like an adventure. And to win the game, you need to find a portal tile and then surround it by four crystal tiles. Because one of the neat twists of Forbidden Jungle is that you can move tiles around, which makes it feel so different from the rest of the series. You have to use these configurator machines and it works like those sliding puzzles you had as a kid. You can only move a tile if there's space for it to go. But to make space, you can use a destruct switch to blow up a tile, killing everything on it. This is my favorite thing about the game. It's such a novelty to be able to destroy the world you're in, like playing a video game with a destructible environment for the first time. One game we used the compeller to move 10 spiders to the same tile, then blew them to smithereens. It felt like something out of a movie. There's a lot of fun mechanisms in this game, like the electrifier, which works like one of those blue fly zappers. It kills any spiders that move onto it. The spiders come in three forms. Eggs, which turn into hatchlings, which turn into adult spiders. They're the ones that can kill you. It gives a nice progression to the threat. If you don't deal with the eggs, you'll be in trouble later on. And because the eggs appear in nests, 
the more of the map you reveal, the more enemies you'll be dealing with. The adults also spin webs, which make it much harder to get around the board. And the adults move before biting anyone on their tile, so you're not safe being anywhere near them. And because there's four directions each spider could move in, the enemy is hard to predict, and I think that might frustrate certain gamers who want to feel more in control. But I really like the added fear that it brings. We've all been terrorized by an unpredictable spider who doesn't go where you want. Not that I'm scared of spiders. I just refuse to go to Australia because of the people. You see someone rave about a game like Thunder Road Vendetta, and it's easy to dismiss it as nostalgia or theme blindness. So before I talk about it, I want to point out that I've never played the original game, I've never watched any of the Mad Max films, I don't yearn for the desert, and I've never enjoyed a car accident. With all that in mind, Thunder Road Vendetta was as appealing to me as a tax return and yet I bravely overcame my biases to enjoy it anyway. This is my story. It's a racing game in which you're all trying to run each other off the road. You literally can't win the game until one player is dead, or eliminated from the game if you're a bunch of softies. Then it's first to the finish, which is such a great premise because it guarantees there'll be action. I mean, we'd all watch the Tour de France if they could push each other off the mountain. You each have three cars, Daddy Bear, Mummy Bear, and Baby Bear, and you're trying to keep them alive, stay ahead of the pack, but also use them to wipe out the other player's cars, which you can do in a variety of fun ways. You can ram into them to try and bump them off the road, but it can always backfire because the dice decide which of you moves and where. So you could ram into them and end up flying yourself into the cliff, destroying your car. When that happens, everyone will be saying it's karma but you could say it's your car muppins or your just deserts, but only if you credit me. You can shoot at cars and if you hit them, they'll take a damage tile, some of which are deadly, like Blast Off, which will throw them across the board, hopefully into some rocks. Then you've got good old fashioned obstacles like oil slicks and car wreckages that can also kill you. What I love about this game is it has the feel of a brainless luck fest and it's just as entertaining as those types of games but it manages to hide decisions at every turn that can pull the odds to your favor. Yes, you roll dice to move, but you can decide which car gets which dice. Yes, ramming a car is a dice roll, but it favors the attacker. And if your car is bigger, you can re-roll those dice. Plus, you've got special powers. You can play defensively by repairing one of your cars or go on the attack by sending out your chopper to airstrike another player. I love the threat of being eliminated because it makes every battle more exciting, but it doesn't ruin your day because once you're knocked out, the game ends soon anyway. It has the same level of chaos and aggression that you get in Survive Escape from Atlantis and Cult Express. If you love those games, you should check this one out. And just like them, it manages to get away with being mean by leaning into it. Somehow you don't mind being punched in the face when everyone else is getting punched as well. It's like that saying, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. And if the whole world's blind, then we don't mind. <laughs> Zoo Vardis is a disappointment that I love. Like having a child that plays Warhammer. It's a reprint of an old Reiner Knizia game called Quo Vardis, in which you played as Roman politicians who must win votes to move up the political ladder and reach the Senate. And now, because board game publishers treat us like children, those politicians have become animals who vote for each other to move up the zoo exhibits. The original theme was perfect for what you do in the game, and I say that as one of the few men who doesn't think about the Roman Empire every day. My Roman Empire is wondering why so many publishers think we want every game rethemed with anthropomorphic animals. I hate this trend so much, I could rant about it for hours, but let's move on. To the name. Zuvardis is the worst name I've ever heard for a board game. It's not a play on words, it's a massacre of them. In just eight characters, it manages to defile two great languages at once, like pissing on the Rosetta Stone. Zuvardis doesn't rhyme with Quo Vardis, unless you pronounce the word zoo like Zoe Deschanel does. And why does it still have Latin in its title when there isn't a speck of ancient Rome in the game itself? It's like walking up to the Parthenon to find a McDonald's inside. Zo Vardis might be the best introduction to negotiation games there is, because it manages to deliver all the deal-making and bribery that you want 
in an easy to learn, quick to play game. Negotiation games are long because talking takes time and Ben refuses to accept my more than generous offer. And Zoo Vardis isn't short, certainly not as short as the box suggests, but it's the shortest negotiation game I've played that feels substantial. And part of that haste comes from an overwhelming need to get to the finish. In classic Canizia style, if you don't have one of your animals in the star exhibit before it fills up, you will lose the game. All your riches are worthless if you have no power. And that would hit harder if you were trying to get into government and not an exhibit, but whatever. To move up the board towards the star exhibit, you need to get a majority vote from the exhibit you're in. And that usually means bribing your exhibit mates, because when you leave the exhibit, you'll get to collect a laurel token from the path. Oh, there's the speck of ancient Rome they left in the game. And some paths have much better tokens than others. For example, this V means very good. But the voter also gets a point for voting, so it pays to get yourself in positions where people need your help. Of course, withholding your vote when they really need it is fun too. My favorite element of Zuvardis are the faction abilities. They're so good at making you negotiate with each other because you can't use your own ability on yourself. You can only use it to help other players. So they're bartering tools. And they all work so nicely with each other as well that you come up with these three-way deals where the rhino lets the ibis take the marmoset with them, so the marmoset lets the ibis take a better token, so the ibis lets the rhino enter a full exhibit. And I love that you just start playing and immediately start making deals. The game just gets out of the way. It's that smooth. It's more fun at five players than four because there's more people voting. And I wouldn't play it at three, but no negotiation game is good at three. And like this review, after half an hour of ranting about how bad the theme is, you forget all about it and just have a great time. I'm a huge fan of detective games, but a common complaint with them is they involve a lot of reading. Well, Perspectives fixes that by trading words for pictures at the usual exchange rate of a thousand to one. You're given photographs that contain everything you need to solve the case, and they're shared out between the players, so you each have your own perspective on the crime, and you can't show it to anyone else. You have to describe it to them instead. That's the magic of the game. Can you communicate what you can see well enough? In my favorite case, a musician has been killed, and you're tasked to look over the CCTV footage of their last gig to spot people in the crowd, and just trying to describe each person by their haircut and clothing is a great challenge. We had so many mix-ups between green mohawks. Seeing your teammates' cards when the round is over is like seeing the photo of a radio DJ. They look nothing like you imagined. It works so well as a team game because there is crucial information on every card, so you need to listen to everyone or you won't solve the case. And the clues bounce off each other to reveal even more. It feels like you have a code and another player has the decoder for it, but in this authentic real world way where the code is a t-shirt and the decoder is a magazine cover. And it's not enough to just share the facts, you then need to fill in the blanks to chat about your findings and work out the bigger picture. That's the bit I love about crime solving games. And in all three cases, we had those eureka moments where it all clicks together. And I love how the cases build to their climax. Each one is split into four acts and each act has a mystery to solve that's part of the wider story. In the fourth act, you're not given any new cards, but you now put them all face up and try to answer the final questions that tie the whole story together. The information had been in front of your eyes the whole time. Like that moment in an M. Night Shyamalan movie when you finally realize it's really bad. But the most important thing is that all three cases were really well designed with mysteries that were challenging and stories that were really enjoyable to follow. And it's not surprising given that it's co-designed by Dave Neal, who wrote the most recent Sherlock Holmes consulting detective set, The Baker Street Irregulars. Compared to Sherlock, it's a shame to only get three cases in the box. Perspectives is more in line with the Unlock series of escape room games. And my hope is that, like Unlock, they have many more perspective boxes planned because it's a system that could run and run. The game that stood out the most for me in 2023 was Reiner Knizia's Ra, which was first released in 1999, back when I was busy ranking my top 10 Spice Girls, with Sporty taking spots one and two. It's back in this incredible new version from 25th Century Games. 
Zuvardis Take Note. This is how you reprint a Reiner Knizia game. They've kept the same ancient Egyptian theme, but given the artwork a beautiful upgrade from Ian O'Toole. And if Tutankhamun was getting buried today, that's who he'd commission to do his mask if Vincent Dutre is busy. I saw a great description of the art from someone on Reddit that all the previous versions of Ra have this faded beige look to them as if it's something that's been dug up from the past. But this one is as bright and colorful as Egyptian paintings would have been at the time. And that is when we're playing. You're trying to build monuments and advance your civilization to be the best ancient Egypt you can be. Although, Back then, we just called it Egypt. It's an auction game. On your turn, you can either draw a new tile from the massive bag, adding it to the current lot, or you can call Ra by grabbing this massive wooden cudgel to start the auction. Whoever bids the most will win the entire collection on display. You can only bid once, and you bid with these fixed numbers. It's all about sizing up the other players, deciding how much you think they want something because you can see what numbers they have, but which are they willing to spend? Every time a raw tile is drawn from the bag, you lurch closer to the end of the round, when any bidding tokens you haven't spent are wasted. It's this looming threat that makes everyone act irrationally, like buying overpriced tat at the airport just to use up your foreign currency in time. But you're also desperate to keep drawing tiles, risking the end, because if you don't have any civilization tiles at the end of the round, you'll lose points. This is the difference between a great game and a passable one. I played another auction game from this year and it had none of the desperation, the threat of failure, and the bitter rivalry of Ra. One of my patrons pointed me towards a community this year called OGs that celebrates old school German style games. And it was like being diagnosed with a condition that I didn't know how to name. All these other people who believe Games are at their best when they're simple to learn, focus on a shared playing area, and have loads of interaction between the players. There's a list of games that meet their criteria, and in there are all these games that I love, like Ra and Chinatown and Lost Cities, which are all from 1999. I know what you're thinking, and you're right, the Millennium Bug has a lot to answer for. And as much as I love the last nine games in this list, I don't think any of them will be talked about in another 25 years. Sadly, they don't make them like RAR anymore, but they do reprint them. Those are my top 10 board games of 2023. If you want to know my 20 to 11 favorite games, you can watch my Patreon exclusive video at patreon.com forward slash actualol. If you'd like to buy any of the games in this list, there are links below. And if you're new to the channel, please subscribe for more videos like this. I'm John Perkis, thanks for watching. Before I go, I'm looking for a video editor to help me edit actual old videos. If you meet the following criteria and you're available to do paid work to edit videos for actual old, then please get in touch. I'm looking for someone that, first of all, likes actual old videos, watches them, understands them, and appreciates uh, my sense of humor. That's the most important one. Uh, but also that you know board games, but hopefully if you watch my videos, you know board games. Uh, that you're based in the UK, and that you know how to use and you own Adobe Premiere editing software. If all of those match and you are interested in editing videos for me, then please get in touch. I'll put a link in the description. <laughs> <laughs>